again everyone and welcome to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and we're very excited to be with you again for another half hour of Good Gardening. We've got a great program for you today as we'll be featuring tips on cleaning up your garden in the fall, an interview with Dave Titterington focusing on wild bird seed, and we'll also answer a few of your gardening questions later in the show. But to start today's program, we'd like to talk to you about what is probably the most popular flower in the country, and that's roses. You can see them in just about every public, private, formal or informal garden. Let's take a minute to introduce you to roses. Roses are a beloved landscape plant and they've been that way for centuries. Whether you love the ones that climb on the trellis and remind you of your grandmother's garden, or the ones that come 12 in a box at Valentine's Day or perhaps even out of your own cutting garden, or the ones that are shrubs that can be used in the landscape in a multitude of ways, they become a great addition if you know how to choose them, how to plant them, how to manage the insects and pests, and more importantly, how to choose what you love. Classification of roses can sound pretty complicated. Everything from species roses to rugosa roses, modern roses, shrub roses, grandiflorus floribundus. But let's start talking first about the modern shrub roses. They are a great addition to the landscape. Again, if you want that color, if you want long season of flowering, perhaps even the complement of hips that would take you into the winter months. The modern shrub roses oftentimes are very complex parentage. They were first selected and bred for their hardiness, and that's a very important characteristic of the modern shrub roses. Many of them are on their own root, which means they may die to the ground in the winter, but they won't die entirely. They have been bred oftentimes for very clean foliage. Perhaps they're dwarf with multiple flowers, little tiny flowers. The, the range can also be very big, fully double. The rebloomers, such as the knockout series, is a kind of a classic of the modern shrub roses. That doesn't mean they're disease, uh, completely disease resistant, but they are disease resistant. That clean foliage is a very important part of the modern shrub roses. Again, they can be fully double, they can be single roses, they can have a light fragrance. They don't typically have the very deep, old-fashioned rose scent that we think of with other types of roses. A key thing to keep in mind for them though, however, is they really are a shrub. We don't take them to the ground prior to the winter months because that can hurt the hardiness. But they also look just great in the landscape if you combine them with the grasses, other perennials, even shrubs, so that they, they can give you that layering effect in the landscape between taller material and shorter material. When most people think about roses, they think of the grandifloras and the floribundas, the ones that are the classic perfect bud, they open into fully double forms, beautiful color range. They are not without a lot of management, however, to be able to get those beautiful flowers. They come in an incredible range of colors and sizes and shapes. They are disease prone, not very disease resistant, and you really should select for the ones that look the best during the growing season. Be prepared also to do a lot of pruning, a lot of management of the canes of those roses, some significant cutting back in the winter, before the winter months hit, cover those crowns so that they really don't die over the winter months, and also look for all those insect pests. We have a, a, a variety of different types of roses here, the floribundas, the grandifloras, the true cutting roses in the Hayman Rose Garden. One of the best ways for people to choose is to pick the colors you love for the situation that you have in which they will be growing. The best time to buy and plant roses in our zone is actually in the spring. So take advantage of thinking about all that wonderful beauty and scent and smell you might want in your own landscape. Choose wisely, whether it's a shrub rose, a floribunda, a grandiflora, a dwarf, a climbing rose, and watch our series because we are going to be talking about how to plant, how to manage, and most importantly, we're gonna be talking about those insect and disease pests that can really damage your roses. As we've just seen, there are plenty of roses to choose from. 
The range of colors, sizes, and scents are plentiful enough so that you should be able to find something that really will fit your taste, your landscape, and your ability to manage them. For our second feature today, let's take a step back or perhaps a few steps forward. Getting that garden cleaned up in the fall is a real key step to avoiding insect and disease pest problems throughout the growing season. Did you get a chance to properly clean up your vegetables after harvest or cut back those ornamentals that were past their prime? If not, here are a few tips for you to consider next fall. Since Backyard Farmer ends so early in the fall, we really don't get much of a chance to talk to you about why sanitation in the garden is such a great idea. We're going to take a look around our garden and see just exactly why we're doing the cleanup and what difference it's going to make when we come to next spring season. We always tell our viewers that one of the best things you want to do is choose varieties that are as disease resistant as possible. With tomatoes, depending on what you're after, you may end up with heirlooms that are pretty disease prone. You may end up also with tomatoes that are really disease resistant, but they grow like a jungle, and they might even continue producing until the first hard frost. If you leave that debris stand, however, you have all sorts of potential problems next year, whether it's the blights of tomatoes or whether it actually harbors all sorts of insects. The other thing that happens is if you leave that rotten fruit on the ground, you can end up with vertebrate pests that can oftentimes be a problem in the garden anyway. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is pick off as many of those tomatoes as you can possibly harvest and eat, clean up the debris, get rid of the vines, pull the roots out of the soil, and then ideally get that soil ready for the next spring. Tomatoes are also one of the crops that you wanna make sure you can rotate if at all possible, because a lot of the diseases that they do carry can be transmitted in the soil. One of the real interesting things that we have to clean up is of course our squash and pumpkins and watermelons if you're so lucky as to have watermelons. During the season we talk a lot about squash vine borers, cucumber beetles, all those little insects that can get in there and ruin the vines, ruin the crop, cause gardeners heartache when it comes to actually getting a crop. You can see the debris on the ground under the leaves of our pumpkins and while we have a great crop of pumpkins themselves, we're gonna to wanna to make sure we get all of this debris cleaned up, not only so that it doesn't harbor the eggs of those insects, but we also had some diseases in the foliage this year. This is another location where ideally we're going to do a little bit of rotation of crop if at all possible. Know full well that since we do not spray up here, we probably are going to have vine borers and squash beetles again next year. You may have put in some cool season crops very early last spring, and if you're lucky, they are still producing. This is the Artworks Broccoli, which is one of the All-America selections. We actually didn't do the harvesting the way we probably should have, but what this is supposed to do is produce very tiny, small heads as opposed to the giant ones. The cool season crops can go later into the season, and some of them actually increase in flavor after a hard frost, such as Brussels sprouts. That also means that if you're going to do good garden cleanup, you might be doing it in stages pull these out later, allow them to complete their cycle, and then get ready for next spring. If you put in cool season crops this fall, you may or may not have had good success. And if you didn't, especially if you're working in a raised bed or in a location where you've done other plantings like this before, you might wanna consider going ahead and doing some pretty significant soil amending before next spring. The material you cut or remove from your garden in the fall for cleanup can be put in the compost pile as long as it is pretty disease free and especially if you have built a compost pile correctly so that it will get hot enough to kill the diseases and kill most of the insect eggs. This is a great example of one of the compost piles that we use in the backyard farmer garden. We lift these sections off, our master gardeners turn it, then we can actually spread that material on the garden either later this fall or in the spring and it helps enrich the soil and gets rid of all that debris without taking it to the landfill. Be aware, however, also that if you're in a location where all of those voles and ground squirrels and other critters that Dennis Ferraro talks about on the show 
make the garden their home. They absolutely love going up into the warmth of that compost pile. You might pull the top off of that and discover that you have a bitty family of rodents living in there as well. Voles and other critters need food and shelter during the winter months. So take that into consideration when your harvest is over and it's time to do some of those chores. Make mental notes as to where you planted vegetables and consider rotating their growing spaces next spring. Good sanitation in the fall goes a long way to a healthy, vibrant garden in the spring and summer. Speaking of feeding critters, a lot of people like to make sure the birds are taken care of in the cold by setting up bird feeders in their backyards. There are plenty of feeders and seed available on the market, but which ones are the right choice? We recently talked to wild bird habitat owner Dave Titterington about his recommendations to help those beautiful birds make it through the winter. If you're one of those people who is creeped out by Alfred Hitchcock's movie, The Birds, you're still going to want to watch this segment because I have the pleasure of talking today to Dave Titterington of Wild Bird Habitat Store in Lincoln. We're going to talk about all the really great things about attracting birds to your landscape. Dave, if people really want to attract birds to their landscape, I'm assuming there are a lot of pretty simple things that they need to begin with. Can you elaborate on that a little bit for our viewers? Well, primarily there's about six different basic bird feeders and those feeders attract different species of birds. So you want to consider the type of bird feeders that you have. You also want to consider the type of seed that you put in those feeders. Um, birds come to elevated feeders primarily for the nut meats because they're high in fat, high in protein. Um, you don't want to fill those feeders with a lot of seed that's got the small white millet in it. Birds are going to come up and pick out what they want. They don't have a lot of time to search through the seed because of predators that they're always on alert for, uh, because of competition with other birds. So it's kind of a combination of pairing up the right type of feeder with the right type of feed to attract the largest variety of bird species you'd like to see in your backyard during the summer or winter months. If you are attracting birds to the landscape, do you really need those edible plants? Couldn't we just go out on an acreage, stuff all those feeders every place and still get them to fly in? And if, if not, why not? Why wouldn't they do that? Well, birds need a diverse diet and bird feeders are only providing about 25 to 30% of a bird's diet. It's actually basically a supplemental food source for them, but they primarily need the natural foods uh, that they'll find out uh, in the woodlands and the undergrowth of the woodlands. Um, out in the grasslands. Uh, so there's a lot of natural foods and you can do this by planting some of those native and natural foods in your yard. You're gonna attract a lot of species, probably species that wouldn't even come to your backyard for the bird feeders. You'll pull some warblers in, maybe some cedar wax wings with some of the berries and some of the shrubs that you plant. So it's a good idea to not just have feeders, but have a good variety of other natural foods for the birds and you'll really increase the birds coming to your habitat plus provide good nesting habitat for them, good cover if predators come around. So you wanna kinda of consider the whole picture. If there were products that you would recommend for people, what would they be? And kind of the flip of that is why would you not recommend those products for 2016 and beyond? Well, when you come to feeders, we've got feeders that are really standard feeders. They've been on the market for quite a while. They've had major improvements to them, in fact, now they come with lifetime warranties. We take care of all the warranties right here at the store. They come with a lifetime warranty. They're made in the USA. Uh, they're proven to be successful, whether it's a platform feeder, seed tube feeder, Niger thistle feeder, uh, hopper feeder, any of the basic feeders. And we have some different variations of those feeders, but we wanna make sure we give uh, our customers a really quality product, preferably made in the US. Uh, something that's going to withstand the elements because they are outdoors and something that we can repair if something goes wrong with it. So there are a lot of new products on the market. We kind of scrutinize those products to make sure they meet our standards before we put them up for uh, customers to view and purchase. We get the question a lot from people about how in the world do I keep all that seed from germinating under my feeder? And then of course the voles come in and everything else. So how can they keep that from happening? Well, there is gonna be a certain amount of sanitation you're gonna to have to provide if you're gonna feed birds in your backyard. It doesn't take a lot of time. 
but you can go with uh, products such as sunflower hearts, uh, whole sunflower seeds, or some of our no mess feeds, where you don't have a lot of debris left on the ground. You're still going to have some. Uh, you want to make sure what you're buying uh, doesn't contain a lot of weed seeds, or uh, one that's uh, big that we find is canary reed grass that you don't want to get started in your yard, especially if you're around a wetland. Uh, so you want to read the labels. All seeds got to be labeled by law. Read those labels, read the ingredients in there. If it starts out assorted grain products, milo, wheat, barley, red millet, you might want to stay away from those products uh, because you just the birds aren't going to eat it. Uh, that's going to germinate. So that, that cutting back on that, buying a good quality seed, that's really going to help minimize uh, what grows underneath that feeder. So on that note, I think there's really only one thing to do as we leave wild bird habitat. That would be first off, say thanks to Dave. So I guess this is two things. And the second, I need to refill my bird feeder. So well, I'm off with my bags and I'm going to get <laughs> some more seed. Well, we really appreciate you uh, giving us this opportunity to help educate people. And uh, we hope you get a lot of listeners and viewers watching it. Talking to a professional like Dave and knowing what to look for on the label will help you make smart choices when it comes to bird feed. Pick the right feeder and feed and the birds will flock to your backyard this winter. Okay, time to put on your thinking caps and repeat after me. Suffrutescent. What the heck does that word mean? Well, it could mean a lot to some of the ornamentals you have planted around your home. What to do with suffrutescence is the focus of this week's landscape lesson. We often use words in scientific language that are pretty complicated and have sort of obscure meanings, but when you come right down to it, they're pretty simple. One of those words is suffrutescent, and if you think semi-woody or plants that really don't want to leave their crowns hardy over the winter months, that is what suffrutescent means. One of the reasons that's an important term to understand is we have a handful of plants in the, in the Plains states that do have that habit. That means the crown is woody or solid and strong, and the top is not. That's where the word semi-woody comes from. And we wanna manage those a little differently than we do standard perennials or standard shrubs. So of course a perennial has stems that are not woody and they have the water pressure to hold those stems upright and then they die to the crown or you know, if they're a little bit semi-evergreen, we can leave that foliage stand over the winter months. Woody shrubs, on the other hand, the root system, the caudex or the crown and the stems themselves are woody. So typically we leave those stand over the winter months or if we do do pruning on them, we can expect that foliage to regenerate. Our handful of plants that are semi-woody or suffrutescent should be handled differently. What we suggest on that is if you do wanna do some pruning of those plants in the fall of the year, just for cleanup or to tidy up the garden or the landscape a little bit. Do not take those all the way back down to the ground or down to four to six inches above the ground. What you wanna do is leave 18 to 24 inches, if at all possible, make those pruning cuts and help protect the crown of the plant over the winter months. Part of the damage that can occur with some of the suffrutescent plants are the ones that are a little bit marginally hardy, but they're shrub-like is that if they have a hollow stem, like hibiscus as an example, you can get water down into that stem that can go down into that woody crown or that semi-woody crown and crack it in the winter months as that water expands and freezes. The other thing that can happen with a suffrutescent plant like butterfly bush or blue mist spirea is we leave those big stems standing over the winter months and then if they do refoliate or leaf out the, the coming spring, you have all sorts of sort of dead bare twiggage at the base. You have a bit of leafage at the top, but at the base of the plant, you don't get that regeneration of the ground foliage. And that's really what you're after. So to manage those suffrutescent plants properly, you wanna do the pruning cuts in the fall, pretty low, pretty high up in the, in the plant, and then take the rest of that growth off in the spring when they have started to leaf out. A few well-timed and placed cuts in the fall if necessary, and again in the spring for sure, can make a world of difference for these plants. And we hope that helps you understand not only when and where, but what needs this kind of attention. 
Okay, let's take a few minutes now to answer our viewers' emails. We'd love to hear from you, and perhaps you could share a picture or two with us. Just send us an email to byf at unl.edu. Our first question comes from Anita, and she has a gala apple tree. It's about five to six years old. This is the first year it's actually born fruit, so that was a good thing. But she's noticing that it's got what she's describing as a fungus right at one pretty critical juncture of the branches. She's wondering whether that is something that can be removed or dealt with to make sure that plant continues to be healthy. And as we look at the photographs on this, the unfortunate thing is it appears as though what she has happening is what we call included bark. That means that the main stem is being pinched off or is actually growing up through two other branches that are too close together. The attachment of those side branches to the main trunk is weak and weakening. That's likely where the crack occurred. Once the crack occurs, you get uh, fungus growing in kind of that moist environment. You might have additional insect damage happening. So unfortunately, really about the only things she can hope to do in this case is keep that tree as healthy as possible. Consider starting another one maybe reduce the weight of those side branches to help to keep them from peeling off of the main trunk. And that really is kind of an unfortunate situation. That's structural on this particular plant. We have a question from Stan in the Ashland Gretna area. This is a plant ID question that came in earlier this fall, which is actually a really good time of year to identify those shrubs or trees that might be growing up in place of some of the things you want. Maybe the birds have brought them to you and that is exactly probably what happened here. This is one of our honeysuckles. Unfortunately, it is also one of the ones that is on the invasive species list. You can identify honeysuckle by the opposite leaves and by the paired or twinned red berries, kind of a soft um, fleshy fruit which the birds absolutely relish. They spread them all over. This is a very aggressive shrub. It is one that will go from zero to about six feet if you blink twice. So unless you really are gonna keep that under control in the surrounding area, you need to get that out of the landscape stand. For our final feature today, we'll return to the subject of roses. Just like everything else that grows, you're going to face some challenges with insect pests. Roses are no different. For expert help on what's eating our roses and what to do about it, here's Nebraska Extension entomologist, Jonathan Larson. Today we're going to talk about roses. Everybody loves these beautiful plants. They're the symbol for love. Everybody likes to take care of them and make them look pretty. And unfortunately, we do have a few different kinds of pests that can get on these beautiful plants. We have a few different kinds like thrips. We can also experience problems with Japanese beetles. We can see problems with aphids, as well as another pest known as the rose slug. And these all attack different portions of your rose plant. If you are concerned about thrips, you're gonna be looking in the flower area. That's where they like to infest. There's a couple of different kinds that you can encounter, but the most common one is the Western flower thrips, and they infest up here in the petals. And what you'll notice with these insects is small, very tiny, very tiny creatures moving around in the petals. They're almost indistinguishable from just dust. It's very difficult to see them. You almost need a hand lens to take a closer look at them. Symptoms of thrips are gonna include looking for the damage that they cause with their interesting mouth parts. Their mouths are half sort of piercing and half slurping. And so they will puncture the petal of the rose and leave a little puncture mark. And then as they slurp those fluids up, they leave behind speckling damage or stippling damage on the petals. You may also notice their fecal material. It's usually shiny and black. It looks like somebody has flecked motor oil into the, the petals of your flower. If you wanna control these thrips, you can go out with a product like Piola. You could also use neem oil or spinosad. The only warning I would give you with spinosad is to apply that maybe in the evening time uh, when the bees are not flying around the plant, and that way you can protect those important pollinators but remove the thrips that you don't want around. With that, we'll move into the stem of the plant. That's where you get aphids. Everybody's experienced aphids on their different kinds of plants. 
The symptoms that they can leave behind are again stippling as well as piles of honeydew that they leave behind. Their fecal material is sort of a sticky, gross substance that builds up on the plant. Aphids, you can control those in the early morning with a jet spray of water. Just get your hose out and take a big jet spray and bl blow them off there and they'll fall to the ground. They're too dumb to find their way back up onto the plant. You could also try spinosad or neem oil for those as well. If you go to the leaves of the plant, you can experience two uh, distinct pests that will infest those areas. The first one is the Japanese beetle. It'll also attack the petals of the plant and it'll shred those into a fine powder. If it's feeding on the leaves though, it'll leave behind skeletonized, doily looking leaves on the plant. These are big orange and green uh, beetles with white spots on their butt. You can control these with a lot of different kinds of products. You can treat the leaves with carbaryl. You can treat them with bifenthrin. You can also go with pyola, and that is an organic option that will provide you about 10 to maybe even 11 or 12 days of protection. If you're gonna try and treat the beetles in the flower portion of the plant, I would again caution you to treat at night so you avoid interacting with the bees that are visiting your roses, but you'll be able to have that product dried and the residues will be there to protect the petals from the Japanese beetle. The other pest on the, the leaves that you can get is called the rose slug, and that's a bit of a misnomer. It's not a slug at all. It looks sort of like a caterpillar, but it's actually a baby wasp. And so the rose slug will feed on the top and bottom parts of the rose leaf. They will scrape it away and they create this window pane damage in the leaf. You can almost see through it after they've removed several of the layers on the leaf. As they get bigger, they'll feed all the way through the plant and they will create skeletonizing damage as well. Those again can be controlled with just about any of the products I've mentioned before, neem oil, spinosad, pyola. Those are some of the more organic options. Or you can go with strict insecticides like carbaryl or bifenthrin. That's how you can protect your plant, keep them looking beautiful so you can have these nice roses out in front of your house. I hope that helps. Just keep your eyes open for these pests and you'll be able to control them. The first step in control is keeping a sharp eye on your roses. And if you do find something causing a problem, Jonathan mentioned both traditional chemicals and some IPM natural controls as well. Thank you so much for joining us again for Lifestyle Gardening. Next time we'll be showing you some beautiful ornamentals for fall color, and we've got a fun feature interview on millet. So good morning, good gardening, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening. Mm -hmm.